I think your ad's heavy. Let's start a new religion. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? What do you want to get rid of first? Come on. I think when we I think when we look back in history, when we look at the directions that Jewish mysticism took through Kabbalah, through Hasidism, neo Hasidism, I think I think that your name is gonna whether you like that or not, your name is gonna be an important part of that story. And that's partially because of the tremendous work that you've done in that space. And and also partially because the people, because you've been a torchbearer in that space. People like Hillel Zeitlin, like Zalman Shachter Shalami, like Madam Buber, like like Avram Yeshua Heschel, these great teachers of yours. And I think I think we live in a world which is starving for great teachers, starving for direction. And as a torchbearer, I'd like to ask you what what great wisdom do do you have from those great teachers that we can continue to to create our own meaning in this otherwise meaningless, strange, painful universe? You see, I was a young American Jew who was just the right age to gain maximum benefit from the uh, teachers and rabbis and scholars of Judaism whom Hitler cast up on America's shores, either in the late 30s or the late 40s. I got to university when I was 16, and there was the first course in Jewish studies I took with Nachum Glatzer. Mm. Nachum Glatzer had been Franz Rosenzweig's disciple at the Lehr House in Frankfurt and had been responsible for uh, any knowledge of both both. Uh, um, 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 Rosenzweig and Franz Kafka in America right after the war. He wrote Franz Rosenzweig's Life and Thought and was the first vehicle through which anybody knew about Rosenzweig. Of course, we heard about Buber from Glatzer as well because he was part of part of that same circle. And so you knew about you knew about that world of German Jewish intellectual life. Um, and then there were various other people who came to Brandeis, taught for a semester until they made the great appointment of my own teacher, Alexander Altman. He taught a course uh, called, um, called Classical Jewish Thought, which I have retooled and retaught probably 50 times over the course of the years at various universities and rabbinical schools. Um, he took the ideas of God, creation, and revelation and traced them through biblical and rabbinic and Jewish philosophical and Kabbalistic teaching down to the 13th century. And the panorama of his knowledge was just incredible. He knew a lot about Kabbalah. And, um, and you felt it was in his bones, not just in his academic teaching. He was very much uh, a, a hair professor type. I don't think I ever saw him without a necktie. And you always related to him as a German professor. But I remember hearing him give a lecture at the Young Israel of Brookline when I was 19 or so. And he talked about uh, he talked about the relationship between the Merkava mysticism and the Kedusha. And when he talked about the angels rising to rising on their feet to heaven, you could sort of feel him rising to heaven with them. And there was something very personal and exciting. He didn't reveal much of it verbally, mm. but you could see that both he and Glatzer, my two great professors at Brandeis, were very much professors, but we students we're, all, we're also interested in who they were Jewishly and what their religious lives were mm-hmm. like. And they were clearly both people who combined an academic approach to Jewish studies with a personal deep piety and saw no conflict between them, or at least presented no conflict between them. And that was very important for me as a person who was becoming an academic and trying to reconstruct a religious life. And so both of them were very important to me. Hey Seekers, I just wanted to tell you about a really cool new video series that's giving a fresh take on something super old. It's a series of videos written and hosted by my friend Noe Jacobson and produced by Unpacked. Noe takes us with him on an epic journey searching for answers on how to live a good life. What's really cool is that each of the videos is structured around an unpacking of one of the Ten Commandments from the Bible, exploring them in new and fascinating ways. Noe moves away from the simple understanding of the commandments, don't murder, don't steal, etc., to ask what do these statements mean to us today, and how may they help us become better people now in the 21st century. It's the kind of stuff that you get when you mix a deep, sensitive thinker, thousand-year-old biblical rules, and the immediacy of YouTube. It's Jewish wisdom at its freshest, and I'm excited to be partnering with them to share it with you.
This is the opening series on what promises to be an exciting new channel from Unpacked called Big Jewish Ideas, where they'll be unpacking exactly that. Each one of the videos are exploring age-old philosophical questions in the hopes that they might lead us to be better people today. It's a new twist on some very old wisdom, and they're doing it in a wonderfully beautiful and direct way. Head over to Big Jewish Ideas, link down in the description, and subscribe so you don't miss out on their new videos, and say hi to them from Zevi. And now, back to the conversation. It was through Altman that I began to read Hans Jonas on, on Gnosticism and, um, and Rudolf Otto on Phenomenology of Religion and Eliade. And um, he very much opened to me the world of comparative religion. My experience with religion until then, of course, had been entirely Jewish. My deep involvement as an adolescent in Jewish religious life and then my rejection of it, but it was all the, the, the board I was playing on, so to speak, was entirely Jewish. But by the time I was in college, Professor Suzuki was coming around and talking about Zen Buddhism and the art of this and that. And, um, and people were, going, were, were talking about going to Zen monasteries. Mm. And, um, and the wisdom of the East was beginning to penetrate. We had all read, we had all read Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha and a few other classics like that of sort of westernized Eastern religion. And it was beginning to happen, and I was beginning to put Hasidism into some, Kabbalah and Hasidism into some of those same boxes. Mm. This was my own oriental piety, so to speak, my own discovery. Uh, when I say oriental, I mean, I mean it in a certain way. It was something very different than the secularized, westernized world in which I lived. I could feel the difference in values. I could feel the, the non-materialism of it. And there was something that was very attractive about that. Um, I did not, we all, we all, those were the year, th that was the beatnik era. Yeah. And we all were rejecting the American culture of the 50s and 60s, Madison Avenue and Hollywood and the, and the grossness and violence of, of the seeming values of American culture, uh, the emphasis on the emphasis on physical beauty and, and the oversexed quality of American culture. We were looking, we were all looking for alternatives. Mm. And my set of alternatives turned out to be a Jewish set of alternatives. I was able to do that because I already had the Hebrew. Right. I already had the access to the sources. Right. So when I was 20 years old, it was either Professor Altman or Zalman Schachter, whom I'd already met. Um, I can tell you about that meeting too, uh, who turned me on to Hillel Seitlin, who mm. gave me an essay of Seitlin's mm. called Yusudot HaChasidut, mm. and said, read this. And that was a crucial discovery for me. But I could do that because I had the Hebrew to do it, and I right. love doing it right. in Hebrew. Right. And all those thousands and thousands of other Jews who were discovering, they're finding their way to Zen monasteries or to or to or to uh, yoga were not were not able to do that. They didn't have the tools for that. So it was that happy series of coincidences. Zalman had come to Brandeis when I was a freshman in college, when I was sixteen. We had a young, dynamic Hill director who only lasted one year at Brandeis. His name was Yitz Greenberg. And he brought Zalman for a weekend. And Zalman impressed the pants off me, I must say. He was the first chassid I'd ever met. Wow. And he was still a good Lubavitcher in those days. He was telling stories about the Rebbe. And, um, and I was very impressed. Uh, by the time I was a senior in college, I'd been through my own religious rebellion and was no longer observant, but I was still involved in Jewish life. And I was president of Hillel. So I invited Zalman to come back. Mm. And um, and it was in the course of that weekend that we really began our relationship. Mm. And somewhere there, it was Zalman who, who turned me on to Zeitlin. Mm. So then Zeitlin became an important teacher for me, I must say, and I spent many years reading him. Yeah. Um, Beautiful thinker. By the time I graduated college, I knew this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to study Jewish mysticism. And so I did what one does. I came to Jerusalem for a year and set it on Professor Sholem's lectures. Mm -hmm and took what's called a Targil, a reading exercise class in studying the Zohar and how to read the Zohar with Rivka Schatz Offenheimer, and I was sort of on the way. Um, Sholem was not, a, was not a significant personal teacher for me. Mm. I just went to the lectures. Mm. But, um, but again, being here in this Jerusalem atmosphere, again, with all the, with all the German Jewish intellectual life that was still very vibrant here, the Hebrew University, they used to call the last of the great German universities. <laughs> And, um, and that was still very much the case. Uh, Simon was here, and, and, 
and Flusser and all kinds of other people who represented that really? that generation, educated in Germany and conducting their conducting their lives here. And I sort of felt myself becoming a part of that. I thought then about staying in Israel and doing a doctorate with Sholem, and people said, oh no, he he's very difficult to work with, and he's biased against Americans, and it will not work. Uh, I thought briefly about going to Chicago to study mm. with Eliada. Mm. Um, but Max Tickton was the Hill Director of the University of Chicago and a dear friend, a mentor of my wife's as it happens. Um, he told me rightly that Eliade is not much interested in Judaism and is somewhat biased against it. And mm. it would be a very mm. complicated project mm. to work with Eliade on mm. Jewish sources. And mm. so I went back to Brandeis and did my doctorate with Altman. On Rabbi Nachman. On, on Rabbi Nachman. Mm. That, was after, that was after the seminary. I went to rabbinical school first and then went back to Brandeis. Yeah. You would have gotten Rabbi Nachman the shaman had you landed under Eliade. I might have, yes, I <laughs> might have. Um, so after the year in Israel, I went to JTS. I went to JTS not because I wanted to be a conservative rabbi, but because I knew I needed the background in Talmud mm. to, uh, to be able to read the Kabbalistic sources. Mm. And uh, since I could not go to yeshiva, I could not uh, really allow myself to, uh, to re-enter that world and lie the way I would have to in order to be acceptable there, JTS was the only alternative. Mm. Um, so I went to the seminary, and I was very unhappy there in my first year. They, I felt I was being treated like a junior high school student. They were taking attendance in classes mm. and things like that, which I hadn't seen since uh, since junior high. And, um, and there was something demeaning about the place. I like to say that I walked into JTS with a copy of Allen Ginsberg's Kaddish or Howl in one pocket of my jeans and a copy of Kedusha Levi in the other pocket, and both were equally unwelcome <laughs> at the seminary, which was a very misnagdish kind of place. After a year, my Talmud teacher, Seymour Siegel, saw that I was very unhappy and thinking of leaving. I, in fact, had drafted a letter to Martin Luther King asking him if there was still room for white people to come work in the movement. Wow. That's what I was thinking of doing if yeah. I left the seminary. But... Um, Several people influenced me to stay. Seymour Siegel said to me, if you had a private program of study with Professor Heschel, would you stay at the seminary? And so they arranged for Heschel to take me on as a private student. Wow. He hadn't had one of those in a number of years. I think uh, mm. I became Heschel's private student, which meant I was exempt from all courses other than Bible, Talmud, and Heschel. And, uh, and both went to Heschel's seminar and, and worked, worked privately under his supervision for four years. So what that were was, you studying uh, with him? What was I studying yeah, with him? Yeah. Well, in his seminar, he did something different every year. One year it was, uh, it was uh, the Shlach HaKadosh. Mm -hmm. uh, another year it was the Baal Shem Tov on prayer, the Abu mm -hmm. Um Another year, we, he, was <laughs> he was not a very good pedagogue. Another year he sat there reading proofs for Torah Bin Hashemayim. <laughs> he had these long, long pages that, that the way proofs came in those days, and he would be reading and correcting in front of us while we, <laughs> while we sat there in a seminar. But it, was a two great, birds with one stone. but it was a great privilege to, do, to yeah, be there with him right. while he was doing that. Sure. And I've taught Torah Bin Hashemayim uh, also for 50 years uh, uh, as a very important way into rabbinic thought. But what were you learning one-on-one -on -one with him outside of the seminars? So he asked me, he said to me, read, um, read the Avodos HaKodesh by Rabbi Meir in Gabay. Now, the mm. Avodos HaKodesh is a huge book. Mm. It is a kind of uh, Kabbalistic summa in the generation mm. just before just before Cordovera and Luria. Mm. So it summarizes Kabbalah Tzvirot. But, but Ibn Gabay, who was, who was one of the uh, exiles from Spain, he tells the story in the introduction to his book, that he had to leave Spain when he, he the idea get on the ships when he was 11 years old. We don't know where he wound up. His books were published in Constantinople, mm. but we don't know if he lived there or somewhere mm. else mm. in the in the Ottoman Empire. Mm. And he wrote this great book called Avodata Kodesh, which is both a summary of Kabbalistic teaching and an anti maimonidean polemic. The mm. third the third of the four parts is all is all an attack on Maimonides on, on, on the basis of Kabbalah. And Heschel said, read it and write a paper. Hmm. So I spent two years reading it thoroughly, and I wrote a 100-page paper in Hebrew, and I don't think Heschel ever read my paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I would say, Professor Heschel, have you read my, have you read my Ibn Gabay paper yet? And he would say, Arthur, how are you? In this very <laughs> existential way. <laughs> and I wanted to say, but I want to know about my paper. Right. And then, of course, when I, when I needed Heschel in a sort of, in a sort of confusion of faith moment, he would say, 
Also, have you read chapter, uh, section 3, chapter 52 of Maimonides recently? Uh, you know, we played this game. Uh, um, uh, I could not let him be my Rebbe, and, mm. and, and I wanted more than a professor. Mm. And, uh, and it was sort of back and forth between professor and Rebbe. Mm. But, um, but I learned a great deal from him. It was, mm. very, it was a great privilege to mm. be a student. Mm. And uh, he confided in me quite a bit. We somehow were two lonely souls at JTS, mm. two mm. lonely sort of Hasidic-spirited souls at JTS. In a sea of misnagdim. Uh, in a sea of misnagdim. And so he talked to me about, about how unhappy he was there. And mm. he talked about the Kutzker quite a bit mm. because he was working on him yeah. constantly. Yeah. And, um, and uh, shared something of his, you know, of his own Hasidic past and stories about, stories about his life in Warsaw and things like that. And, and so it was a great, it was a great privilege to be a student. And, um, and I have missed his, this is his 50th year that year, and I've been arguing with him for 50 years. I've been sharing with him, arguing with him for 50 years, because mm. in some ways I'm very much still a Heschel student, and in yeah. some ways I have very much departed from his path. And so he has been a kind of, a kind of uh, um, not living protagonist in my right, life right. for a very long time. Right, right. An ongoing bar plukta, perhaps. That's right, that's right, yes. It's the, the journey, as you're saying it, I'm reflecting on how on how so many people, as you're saying, made this max ex- exodus from American um, oversexed materialism, meaninglessness, empty capitalism towards the East, towards the silence, towards Nirvana, uh, and and the chances that you had the skills and and the interest at that moment to channel those same that same seeking drive back into Judaism is something of a miracle, it seems. And, and it seems to me that in a lot of your work, you're trying to expand that window so that for people in generations forward, the chances of them, the chances of young Jews looking for meaning, looking for purpose, looking for God, whatever that means, the chances of them finding that in Judaism still is less of a miracle. Is that a fair description? Well, miracle is a loaded <laughs> word. <laughs> and so, we would have to spend a long time talking about what we mean by it. Right. Um, but... Uh, Yes, I've taken that as a mission, of course. I realized that this door was open to me somehow because of a strange combination of factors. The fact that I fell in love with the Hebrew language at such a young age. Yeah. And the fact that my grandparents took me to shul and I had that, I had that sort of familiarity with what, what East European Jewish thinking was like. I would, I would, as a, I would as a child sit and try to puzzle out their Yiddish newspaper on the, on the, on, on the table and, 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 and read things. And so, so I kind of was part of that world. And yes, I've always wanted to open the world of, of, of Jewish teaching to people who didn't have that privilege, whether they were born Jews and, or not, um, but to somehow make that accessible, to say there are great spiritual treasures to be found here, and I want to unlock them for you. Um, now, from Nachum Glatzer, I learned the value of translation. Glatzer mm. was a person who very much believed in putting the sources before people mm. and letting them learn them, mm. make presenting the sources in a new, attractive way. So his, in addition to writing on Rosenzweig and writing on, on various aspects of Jewish history and historical thought, he edited anthologies. Mm. And when I was uh, leading youth groups in my college years, I taught from his books, Hammer on the Rock, a Midrash anthology, and mm. the language of faith, a, a liturgical anthology, and so on. So the first book I did was Your Word is Fire, which was sort of on the, on the, in the form of one of Glasser's books. Mm. It was a book on, it was a book of contempt, of, of, of Hasidic meditations on prayer, taken from the Amud Atvila that I'd studied with Heschel, but presented, uh, I did it with my friend Barry Holtz, presented in kind of poetic format. And so this is a way to discover something about Jewish prayer instructions. Right. Um, and then I went on from there to do, uh, to do the language of truth, which was selections from, from the Sfat Emet, and then to do, and then to do the, um, the, um, uh, the Mori Naim, and then to do um, the uh, anthology called, uh, called um, the anthology called Speaking, Speaking Torah, Torah. <laughs> and various other things. And now I find myself doing that for Israelis. Mm. I'm now trying to do an anthology of early Hasidic sources for Israelis because I find that it's not accessible to them either. Right, right. I, that, it's fascinating because when you think about how to open a door for someone into a spiritual tradition, 
translating text is not necessarily the first thing you think of. But but it's clear it's clear that your own journey was encountered with great texts. Um, you mentioned it, the essay, the article from Hillel Zeitlin, for example, that um, that Reb Zalman exposed you to. Um, and it's is it true to say that you have that you have yourself a great love of text, and it's that love that you're trying to convey to others? Oh, of course, of course, <laughs> yes, yes. I love the sources, and I have um, lived with that love for more than half a century. And it's one that I try to share. I've tried to share with rabbinical students over so many years um, because it seems to me that the rabbinate is basically a, a lifelong learning career right. of living in the text and sharing right. the textual tradition. Right. That's what they're supposed to be doing with right. their lives. Right. And, um, and so I've tried to convey that love of text to, to, to generations of students and to generations of readers. Hmm. So even when I write theology, I am in some ways sort of rewriting texts. Hmm. I am sort of taking nuggets out of the text and polishing them and, 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 and refitting them into my own contemporary language. But it is all somehow coming out of the yeah. of tradition of textual learning. Yeah. You know, I was never very much attracted to the path of, oh, you're interested in Hasidism, let's go to Williamsburg and spend another Shabbos with the with the Spinkerov or the right, Paparov right, or the right. or this group of Hasidim or that group, that did not that did not excite me. Right. When I was a rabbinical student, I had a friend, a dear friend, who was a fellow student named Phil Goodman of Shalom. and Phil uh, was lived a very strange double life of studying at the Jewish Theological Seminary and living as a Bob of Hasid, living in the Bob of community. And he invited me to spend, I remember, a Simchas Torah at Bob of and Sukkot and Sukkot at Bob of. The Rebbe was a very, the old Baba for Rebbe, the Rebbe Shlomo was a very beautiful man, and it was very nice to be there. But I remember getting into conversations with some of the Hasidim my own age, uh, conversations in Yiddish, and realizing that I could never be one of them. Mm. I, I, I just didn't share many values with them, especially yeah. when they began talking about Goyim yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and what they thought of the outside world. Of course, these were all children of survivors. Yeah. This, these were the 1960s, and I, mm. I, don't, I don't blame children of Holocaust survivors for having, for having negative feelings toward non-Jews, right. but, uh, but I realized I just could not, could not begin to yeah. fit in there, and yeah. that, was, that was a sort of rare experience. My ventures into that world of the living Hasidic community were mostly book buying ventures. Right. I would go to bookstores. Right. Right. That I was happy to do. Right. But in terms of going to hear or see this Rebbe or that Rebbe, down to this day, I'm not very attracted to it. I live here in Jerusalem much of the time, and I don't venture into Mea uh, Sharim uh, for a Shalosh for, 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 for or right. for listening to a Rebbe. Right. It's, you know, it's interesting. I, I like you. I'm a real, real lover of books. And, and if I could, I would just spend my entire day with them. But I want to play devil's advocate for a second, if I may. Isn't sometimes Jewish spirituality, if we can use that word, maybe, or Jewish mysticism, sometimes a little too book heavy? You know, the, the, Sufi, the Sufi story of the, the fellow who's traveling up the mountain towards God, but his wagon is weighed down by so many books he can't get up the mountain. Does that, is that ever a feeling that, that concerns you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very much so. We are a very bookish tradition. Yeah. When the Muslims called us the people of the book, they were they were not wrong, right? Yeah. And when that was among the many things non-Jews called us, that was a title we sort of adapted and took for ourselves. Because right. yes, they, they they got it right. right. <laughs> we are indeed people of the book, and um, and sometimes our tradition is over intellectualized. Yeah. Um, I feel that, and I am relatively. Um, light in the volume of in the volume of books I carry with me, mm. which is to say, I have never been attracted to what I call high tech Kabbalah, um, knowing all the ins and outs of the Lurianic system and mm. reading and reading the Leshem's version as opposed to the as opposed to the Emeka Melech's version as opposed to as opposed to um, somebody else's version of, of exactly what what the details of the Lurianic system should be. Mm. Uh, Hasidism left a lot of that behind, mm. and I'm happy with that leaving mm. behind. Mm. I don't carry the whole overly complicated, overly um, sort of intellectual turrets tradition with me. Mm. I'm attracted by, in particular, by somebody like the Magid, who says there's really nothing but Yeshva Ayin, and Ayin Hu Yeshva Yeshua Ayin, <laughs> 
and um, and that's all there is. Do you mind translating? Uh, the simplicity of saying being is nothingness, and nothingness is being, and all the other countless way stations between being and nothingness can be left behind. Mm. And uh, that now I, I carry a Hasidic library, but many of the books in that library say that same thing over and over <laughs> again in various in various garb. Yeah, uh, and the variation of garb is good to keep it to keep it alive. Yes, but um, I do not I do not uh, find a need for the very elaborate, complicated systems gotcha. of Kabbalistic gotcha. thinking. I'm wondering what else the contemporary seeker on your recommendation should pack in their in their bag. And I know that you've written a lot about this and it's maybe not fair to ask in just a interview format. But but I know that you've written on on prayer, on silent meditation, on on the the way that we engage with mitzvot. What, what do you think of the essentials that a contemporary I would say essential subjects, essential books, essential no, no. truths. What are you looking I would, for? I would say I would say more than that. I would say practices, ways of being, um, moving beyond just the the intellectual or the or the bookish. Uh, it has to be both intellectually honest and spiritually rich and moving. And doing both of those is not always easy. Um, I try very hard not to lie to myself, and I try very hard not to lie to people I am I'm teaching and talking to. Now, sometimes I enter the world of traditional language because it's so attractive, and then I have to pull back and say, but what I mean by this is really yeah. the following. Yeah. Um, so if I talk about God creating the world through speaking, I have to say all those, all those words, the God and, and speaking, are, are, have quotation marks around them because I mean them differently than you, than, than you might think. And then I have to go back and talk about how the, evolu- the evolutionary process is one, to which me- in, 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 is one where meaning can be found. And then it turns out when I talk about God speaking, I'm really talking about evolution and personal meaning. Um, so that packing and unpacking is important, uh, but I would say intellectual integrity is important, yeah. and 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 yet, and yet, complexity, hmm. the complexity of language, the complexity of interpretation, uh, the many levels of understanding. Um, the fact that religious language is ultimately not addressed to the rational self, but to a deeper level right. of the inner self, and finding ways to open open oneself to those deeper levels of reality. That's what it's all about. Um, religious language is a springboard for, um, for cultivation of the inner life. And you have to understand that. And use the tradition that way. Um, use the tradition that way. Otherwise, it just becomes an empty burden. Mm. And most people don't seem to get that, that it's all a means to an end. Right. In, in, in Hasidic language, the end is called dvekas. Right. But, uh, but for most people, that doesn't mean anything. Right. That doesn't say anything. Right. Um, and it really means the cultivation of inwardness, the cultivation of a sense that there is a deeper reality than the reality of ordinary perception. And that reality is sometimes carried by the power of symbolic speech and symbolic expression. And so using the tradition in a way that moves in that direction. At the same time, I am a person who has always felt that we are ultimately judged by what we do with our lives and not what we say and not even where we go in our inner selves. So that all this inwardness has to also transform the way we act in the world. And so the way we relate to others, the way we relate to our friends and our students, the way we relate to public issues. Um, I've spent a lot of Saturday nights at demonstrations for the last several months in Jerusalem. And um, I'm very involved, especially in the environmental cause. 
and in the sense that we have to do something to save this beloved planet of ours, and that has everything to do with the spiritual life and the right. values of spiritual right. teaching. Right. And I reject any utter separation between them. In that sense, I am very much a Heschel student. Right. The spiritual life and the activist the life act are two sides activism. of the right. are two sides of the same of, of the same imperative. Right. The spirituality, spiritual life is has an imperative. It right. calls upon you right. to do things and right. to live in certain ways. So, so all of those all of those fit together for me. Yeah. I this this language of packing and unpacking, moving in and out of the traditional language and back into a, a language which is intellectually honest and and that that role of, of going back and forth which is its own form of translation as happy as the person who has come who goes in and out mm. you can walk mm. in and out yes mm. I, it, it seems to me and I'm, I'm going to give a personal reflection from my own journey when I when I began to take Chassidus, Jewish mysticism Hasidism more seriously it challenged the way that I was reading classic Jewish texts and it seemed like very often I had to do this kind of prescription operation where I had to chop the text in a way that fit my new found theology. I was actually chatting with um, a mutual friend of ours, and I, I perhaps I'll keep his name private, who said, you know, Zevi, all of this oneness and pantheism and is all beautiful, but do you think that's what the, when we read the Haggadah on Pesach, we say, this is what has stood for us and for our forefathers. Is that really what we're talking about? And it's, and I, it's I, what we're talking about. It may not be what the <laughs> other of that is talking about, but it's what we want to talk about. So, and it's our Seder. Right. It's our Seder, right. not theirs. So mm. of course we're going to talk about mm. it. Mm. Right. <laughs> right. You, we, can take, we, we can take ownership. It's our Yerusha too. Yes, that's right. Take responsibility for our own spiritual lives. Let me, let me ask you an honest question, which may upset some people though, which is if the ultimate goal is to get to that unity, is to get to that thing behind these words, is, is the traditional liturgy, texts, practices, halacha, is it really still the best way to do it? Or has that become so so calcified and filled with these barnacles and crustaceans that we may as well reinvent something new? If, if, the, if the goal is really just to get to that place. I think you're right, Zephyr. Let's start a new religion. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you want, what do you want to get rid of first? Come on. I want, to, I want to get rid of the misogyny and the xenophobia and the sexism uh -huh. and the dryness and the inability to listen to real human need and desire. And, uh -huh. um, and, and there's so much that I want to get rid of. Uh-huh. Okay. How about the second you could work in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's an old joke. <laughs> um, yes, there are lots of barnacles and lots of incrustations. And sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes you say, is this really worth it? And it's not the best way. It's not the best way to get to the oneness of being. It just happens to be our way. And we in this tradition are like an old couple who've been married for a long time. And we've been in this relationship and we're not going to divorce her or him. Um, because there's a lot of love there. Mm. And yes, there are lots of things that aren't attractive and lots of things I don't like, but I've learned to, I've learned to live with them and this is what I've, this is who I am and this is what I've got. I think that's a fair way of saying it. Mm. Um, already I can see, uh, in Hasidism, where they sometimes catch a glimpse of that truth. When the Yitzhak says there are two ways to worship God, by, by, by spirituality alone or by the mitzvot, you can worship God not through a corporeal thing, you can worship God just by pure devotion. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to worship God through corporeal things because that's how you bring blessing down into this world. Because mm -hmm. we worship God through corporeal things like... Uh, like uh, like tefillin and chauffeurs and things like that, we bring the blessing into the corporeal world. Well, I don't know if we really do, but we but we act on we act that way and we live that way, mm -hmm. and we feel that we feel that blessing in the tefillin and the chauffeur mm -hmm. and in the and the lulav and esrog and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. We feel it, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's very moving. Mm -hmm. But could we be? reaching oneness by you and I sitting together at the Insight Meditation Center in a, in a silent 
30-day retreat. And if we had some uh, meter to measure how close we came to the oneness of being, we would say, hey, didn't we come a lot closer in that 30-day retreat than we did in all the, in, in that whole year of, 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 of Trillin? Um, probably yes. Probably yes. But this is who we are. This is who we are. Mm. This is the tradition we have inherited. Mm. And we have found moments of great beauty in it. Yeah. And that's enough. Mm. That's enough to keep us in the ballpark. Mm. And so we play this Jewish game. And we try to play it in a way that's kind mm. and not heavily imposing itself on people and not bearing a lot of guilt. Mm. Remember, I turned to the Baal Shem Tov partly because I wanted a religion that lessened people's burden of guilt yeah. rather than increasing people's yeah. burden of guilt. Yeah. I think we have too much suffering of guilt in our lives as it is. Yeah. And we don't need religion to make it worse. And so mm. much of religion, mm. so much of Judaism is made to worsen people's burdens of guilt. And the Baal Shem Tov said no to that. That's why I love the Baal Shem Tov so much. The Baal Shem Tov said no to that. Mm. This whole religion of sigufim, of self-torture mm. and, and ascetic practices, he said is a distortion. Mm. And, um, and I bless him for that and love him for that. Mm. And in some ways that allowed Hasidism, my version of Hasidism, to be a liberating religion, a religion for me. And that's what I've tried to convey. Mm. But if you ask, is this the very best way in the world to achieve unity with the oneness of being? I can't make that claim. Right. There's certainly easier ways. <laughs> I don't know. You know. <laughs> he I was mean, he was a radical Jew with the Baal Shem Tov, and he gave us a radical Judaism. Right. And his revolution was never completed. Mm. His revolution was never completed because this thing called Haskalah came along, this yeah. thing called modernity came mm. along, and Hasidism turned on itself and became reactionary instead of revolutionary. Interesting. Do you see it? Do you see it to be completed? Is that how you would conceptualize it? You must read a wonderful book that I've just that I finished reading last year, a wonderful book by Ruven Uriah Cohen mm -hmm. um, called Kulachad Kula about the Lubavitch yeah. Rebbe. Yes, he says the Lubavitch Rebbe believed the Baal Shem Tov's religion was left incomplete, and he was coming to complete it. Mm. And that completion was the redemption. And his mm. messianism was all about the completion of the Baal Shem Tov's mm. revolution. And the Baal Shem Tov's revolution, Uriak, uh, 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 Uriak Cohen says the Rebbe said, yes. um, was really about the oneness of being right. and the alienation of self from other. Right. The beginning of alienation is the alienation of self from other. Right. And that leads to the creation of enemies, and that leads to everything, right. including including the Holocaust right. and so on. Right. And therefore we have to overcome that we have to overcome that separation between self and other, which means right. recognizing that there is only one, recognizing right. that right. it is all one. Yeah. That's where we that's where that's where human sin and suffering and evil all begin. Hmm. Human sin, suffering, and evil all begin in the breaking the connection between the two trees of Eden. Right. In the in the in, in what then becomes alienation. Right. And I don't know if that's really what the the Rebbe Lubavitch Rebbe was thinking. I have not read the Lubavitch Rebbe's voluminous voluminous writings, but uh, uh, but Ruven speaks for me in some ways. Hmm. Um, I very much identified with his uh, with his with his. Uh, uh, with his reading of the Rebbe, yeah. and saying, "Yes, that's the ultimate revolution." The Baal Shem Tov tried to he tried to take seriously yeah. what he had found in previous Kabbalistic sources that there was only one. How would you redo Judaism on the basis of the oneness of being, on the basis of the whole earth is filled with God's glory? Yeah. And eventually, you will realize that the particular mitzvot are just there as as paradigms yes. for teaching you how to treat everything. The yeah. way you treat that esrug is the way you should also treat a lemon and a pear mm -hmm. and a grape. Nice. Nice. Uh, which is to say picking it out carefully and looking at it and loving it and right. smelling it right. and so on. That's, beautiful. Um, that's that's the way we should act toward toward the fruits of toward the fruits of God's creation. Right. Right. And um and, and and the way you 
treat those children maybe it should be the way you treat your own skin and so on mm. because it's all mm. it's all or it's all mm. skin mm. Um, and and we would then get to the point where where we didn't need those individual acts anymore because we would have fully observed that and that would become the revelation that would become the redemption, redemption. they right. would go from that journey from revelation to redemption right. would be that journey where we would treat everything that way but then modernity happened and then the holocaust happened and then history happened right. and then the reality of life happens right. and so we are not we are not on mm. that path anymore mm. Mm. we are on this much more complicated and sometimes down and dirty path yeah yeah I, I i assume you would add to that not just the alienation of self and other but self and self as well and the desire to reunite with our own selves as part of that no well, yeah i don't <laughs> make that, that distinction, distinction. <laughs> got it yeah um <laughs> You know, it's I, I keep there's this um, there's this our own selves, God's own self. Correct, I just you correct. know once we get the self. Uh, this is this let is, me let me say something else. Yeah, please. Um, in this anthology of teachings I've been doing, I've been working on a teaching, working around a teaching uh, from the Degel Machane Ephraim, the Baal Shem Tov grandson, um, which I've also found in other places about about the way in which the mitzvot are addressed to all levels of the self. And it talks about the five levels of the soul. Mm. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechida. Uh, the five levels of the soul. But of course, for me, that's all uh, inward language. Yeah. Um, and he says that he says that Naran, the three levels of the soul that are most familiar, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, I, they, they're not translatable terms, different aspects of the soul, are then related to our to our deeds, to our words, and to our thoughts. And they are all part of our conscious identity. But then there are two more levels within, within, within the mitzvot and within the tradition that are addressed to chaya and yechida, that are addressed to deeper levels of the self. Chaya for me is something like the subconscious and maybe even the collective unconscious. Hmm. Where it speaks to uh, the self that knows that knows myth and that knows dreams, and that knows unconscious movement, and the discovery that these things are transcultural and universal, and 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 the journey from the conscious self from Naran, uh, from our own thoughts, neshama, from our own thoughts into our deeper levels of pre-conscious existence is that journey to Chaya, and that journey from Chaya to Yechida is the journey of that inner consciousness back to the oneness in which it remains rooted, back to the Yechid, back to Yechido Shel Olam, back to, the, back to the inner self of the universe. And that's really what I'm talking about in religious life. I'm talking about the journey through the inner mind uh, and, its, and its deeper levels into unity with the underlying oneness of being. And that's all an internal process. Of course, it's not a vertical process. Sure. It's all internal. Sure. And as you and I know, that's also very much the language of psychedelic voyage these days. Mm. And so spiritual journey and psychedelic voyage are to me very much different aspects of the same, of the same truth we both know and both are seeking. And seeking it in the language of Judaism is sometimes indeed wearing on one's patience, but seeking it only through the quicker, the quicker tripping that has become accessible to us these days is also thin mm. in its delivery system. Mm. It doesn't give us much to live on. It doesn't mm. give us much to nurture us mm in the rest of our lives. So this combination, this Jewish psychedelic path, I'm speaking frankly, that we are both that we are both on in certain ways, is one that needs to be cultivated. Mm. Um, we need psychedelics mm. to help remind us that all this Jewish stuff is not about this oppressive bullshit of you gotta do it this way, but is about liberate inner liberation and turn toward that toward that oneness that that the Hasidic masters know is its real goal. Right. But we forget that because we get so involved, the Judaism gets us so involved in the in the gamesmanship of it. Yeah. And to remind ourselves that this is all a game mm. and to open ourselves up to what the real object of the journey is about, the psychedelic tools have become very useful. Right. I wasn't going to ask because some people 
can consider it, you know, private or intimate. But I'm, I'm wondering if you would be open to speaking about the role that psychedelics have played in your own journey. Well, I just did. <laughs> um, I, started doing, I started doing LSD 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, summer of 1965 to be exact. And, um, and it was terribly important and liberating for me mm. and changed the course of my spiritual life. Mm. Um, now, I had been studying Hasidic texts already for half a dozen years before I did it. Mm. And so it showed me mm. that these things I'd been reading about in books were real, were experientially real, they mm. became. Mm. They sort of overwhelmed me in mm. their, in their, in their, in their, in the truth of the reality as I, as I, as I encountered them. And that has, I stopped taking uh, drugs. Uh, 40 some years ago. I did it only for a period of, of probably seven or eight years, maybe 10 years, something like that, in my late, in my, from my mid 20s to my mid 30s, and then I stopped. Uh, but it has very much been there in the, in the, in the sort of uh, deep memory with which I've continued my spiritual journey. Hmm. And I can't quite imagine having stayed in this journey without, right. without those, uh, right. those, um, those right. transformative experiences. Right. right. I think I think these psychedelic and medicinal therapeutic plants and compounds have become an incredibly important part of contemporary spirituality. That's undeniable, uh, however much we speak about it or don't. But I think again, we're we're lacking guides and teachers and 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 figures who have walked the path before us. And and since we're speaking about it already, I was wondering what what guidance do you give to to a young seeker who is engaging with with these with these uh, devices, with these mediums? I don't have much to offer in the abstract. Um, it has to be done for that person in that conversation in that moment. Um, obviously, I combi I've combined these two, um, the, 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 the deep immersion in, in, in both Jewish practice and Jewish sources and, um, and, the, use of, and the use of hallucinogenics. But I can't say, okay, first you say, first you say a Krishna, and then you say a so and so, and then you pop the pill, and then you wait 13 minutes, and then you do so. No, I don't, I don't have, I don't, right. I don't, I don't, right. I don't have a formula, right. because each person needs to do it differently. Right. I would say, find yourself, find yourself a good guide or a good group with whom to do it, people you trust and, 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 and might even love, and the people who also respect boundaries in good ways, mm -hmm. and, um, and who share your spiritual language. I think do it first with people who share that spiritual language and can enrich it. Later on, you might want to experiment with people from different traditions and different kinds right. of spiritualities who do comparative things that'll also be right. mind-blowing in their own way. Right. But, but I would say, um, first you want to enrich uh, your, own, your, own, your own storehouse right. of experience right. with people who do speak that spiritual language. Right. I, wonder, I wonder what Chassidus might have to say Chassidism to to someone who's on that journey because I think that a lot of there's a lot of internal criticism um, towards spiritual highs, towards moments of 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 um, and and I think there's a real demand for for honesty for for avoda for for uh, how would you translate avoda for for deep inner work and and service. Depends who you read. I think there were, I think there were, in the circle around the Magid, whom I've particularly studied, there were arguments about this. I think that uh, Rav Roma Malach was very much a Malach. He was very much an angel. He wanted to be in the upper worlds and believed that the real place to be was in the upper worlds. It was Levi Yitzchak who said to him, no, God, God said to Moses, God said to Moses, don't come up the mountain, go down from the mountain, because your place is there with the people. The job of the tzaddik is to bring, is to bring shefa, to bring blessing, down to ordinary people who live in the regular world, right. not to live, not to live on the mountaintop. Yeah. So there are different people and there are different moments for that. Yeah. But you can't get that, you can't get that go down from the mountain unless you've been to the mountaintop first. Right. So, um, so I think there is, there is room for all of this and I don't think you can um, be judgmental about it. Say Hasidism says, right. therefore, right. Uh, the, the point is these were people who lived in that world where such highs were, pop were possible, were yeah. real. Yeah. Um, and then how you relate to them is, uh, is a matter of set and setting and moment and, yes, yes. and yeah. emphasis. Yeah, I mean, it seems that otherwise we can be living in quite a desiccated 
form of Judaism, one which really is, has a lot of its life sucked out of it. Yes, though we have we have been there. <laughs> we, we, have, <laughs> we have lived in there for a long We've time. Seen that, yeah. <laughs> there's, you know, there's a really wonderful passage from Rosenzweig, which I think you quote more than once in, throughout your corpus. Rosenzweig says that there's an ABC of Judaism. The A is Anoich Hashem Eikecha, is the voice which metaphorically, perhaps spiritually, rings forth from Sinai constantly. And then, uh, and then B is perhaps, you know, don't make any other images besides for the one, and C and so on and so forth, until we get 2,000 years later and we're quibbling over the X, Y, and Zs of Judaism that we forget there even was an ABC. And uh, I feel that I often, don't remember that passage at all, so I don't think I've quoted okay, it. Okay, okay. But um, but I understand what you're saying, of course. Yeah, and he says we need to kind of reverse engineer the alphabet and go back to the to the aleph base. Go to back the to the aleph, yes. Right, back to the aleph. Yes, you well, you can find that in the Zohar desert where everything comes from the aleph. You have to go back to the aleph. You can also find in 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 in, in Chassidus, um, the whole Torah is really about Anochi v'lo Yelecha. Yeah. Is really about discovering the I am of of, of Sinai. I am. The, the, I am the force that liberates you and worship nothing else to yes. God, and everything else is what they call what, it, what the Zohar calls six hundred and eleven councils mm-hmm. to help you observe those two, right. to help you empower those two. Right. And we have forgotten those two and are too busy, too busy worrying about uh, you know. Yeah, it's it's and it seems to me very clearly that the whole project of of the Baal Shem Tov, which we were speaking about earlier, the project of Chassidus, is to bring us back to to the Aleph, to bring us back to that to that oneness, to the to the a to the to the oneness of being, and um, I have an essay I wrote many years ago called "Restoring the Aleph." I don't know if you know that one. Yes, yes, I think you've included it now in, in your most in your most recent maybe, book. Maybe, maybe. I um, it, and I think I, when we look at a lot of the stories around that early uh, milieu of the Baal Shem Tov, many of them are deeply even antinomian in their sense, in in their in their positing piety and sincerity and authenticity above the simple observance of of the textbook halacha. Which is a message which which seems to somehow have got lost or intentionally <laughs> intentionally put aside through the ages, but but the process the the, the terminology of completing the Balshamtas project is an interesting one. I, I see you much more of a process oriented person than a completion. Do you do you, is there is there a, a t is there an end to that or is that something that is ongoing and ever recurring and it's whether it's Balshamtiv or the Arizal or the prophets that are continuing that process continually in Judaism. Lo you know, you're not you're, you're not going to complete the work. It's not your, it's not your task, and you're, you're, uh, because human beings are not transformed yet, and so the religion can't be transformed. Mm. We are still struggling, and new generations still need to go through the same things that you and I have gone through. Mm. Um, and so we can't have done it all for them. If we gave them, if we gave them a completely liberated Judaism, that too would be desiccated, right? Mm. It would not mm. have would not have a lot of the rough spots that you and I have learned from. Hmm. And so we can't, we can't simply clean it up and give the next, give the next version. Um, so how much, how much can we do? How much are we forced to do? That's always the question. Right, right. Um, you know, the, uh, the, I remember reading the line in Mordechai Kaplan's diary hmm. where he talked about Felix Adler. Felix Adler was the son of a rabbi in New York in the 1920s or so who walked away from Judaism and created something called the Ethical Culture Society, mm. which would take all the very highest values of Judaism and the, and the Bible and the prophets and create a universal religion around them. And we'd have all of those values and all of those truths, and we wouldn't have any of the ritual and any of the divisions between people and so on. And Kaplan, who was very much involved in Jewish life and Jewish renewal and so on, said, sometimes I think he was right. Sometimes, mm. I, mm. sometimes I'm tempted. Why didn't mm. I... Why didn't I take that path? Hmm. And I have those moments too when I say, why didn't I just walk away from all that, all that sludge hmm. and, say, and say, why didn't I, why didn't I take that path and just, and just pull out the things I really cared about? Yeah. You know, the Anochi and Selim Elohim and a few other things that I really care about. I wrote a little book called Judaism's 10 Best Ideas so I could take out some of those values and and Hasidic stories and leave the rest behind, but mm-hmm. it would be, it would become shallow and trivial as right. we all know. Right. Yeah. There's something about keeping in in the, the ugly and the rough that that keeps its depth and keeps its richness. God help us. <laughs> God help us. Neo Hasidism seems to be very much part of that process of the Baal Shem Tov. and and like the Baal Shem Tov had many people who kicked and screamed 
you know, against his... Hasidism was Neo from the beginning. It was all about Neo, right? <laughs> it's still Neo, you're saying. <laughs> it was still... No, it was all about... He right. cut shoots. It was right. all about... Yeah, right. yes, yes, right. yes. Right. It's always, it's always Neo. I wonder, I wonder, um, and you've been very generous with your time, and I'm, I'm not going to keep you for too long. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll cast our, our gaze forward here. Um, you've trained probably, you, you've kind of lived two lives, or at least two, um, a very rich academic life, a professor, uh, chair of Jewish thought, um, both in Brandeis and Pennsylvania. Um, but you've also, you also left twice to get involved in, in, in rabbinical colleges. I walked away from the academic universe in some ways, three times, mm. from graduate school to Chavarat Shalom, from right. University of Pennsylvania to the Reconstruction of Rabbinical College, and from Brandeis, where I had this distinguished chair, to uh, to create the Hebrew, Hebrew College, College Rabbinical School. Right. Yes, right. And and in that process, you've you've trained hundreds of rabbis. I think it's fair to say, um, in a way, very much cementing this this decision to stay in this very long and painful but beautiful love relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The lovers of Song of Songs. And you've, you've ordained many to continue to do that path going forward. It's a, it's a, it's a weighty decision that you've, you've taken in that. Uh, and in that, you've, you've managed to somehow also beautifully balance and marry the academic rigor of the university with the, the spirit and, and call and, and, and moral necessity um, of the rabbinic life. And I see many, many young um, brilliant and clever and caring and devoted uh, students around you. What what kind of message? What kind of what kind of de la der? What kind of food for the for the way are, are you giving to a new generation of rabbis and scholars and students to create a Judaism which is not about the X Y Zs and about guilt, but a Judaism which is about love and about kindness and about about the Aleph, about the oneness ultimately. Well, that's my whole teaching. You have to, they have to read me. <laughs> they have to take me seriously. And um, at this point in my life, it's all about legacy. What am I leaving behind? Uh, you never know how many years you have left. And when you reach this age, you certainly don't know how much time you have left. Mm. And I ask myself every day, what am I, what am I leaving? Mm. And I am trying to leave that message in a dozen different ways um, in my own writings, in translations I do, in selections of Hasidic sources that I do. Um, I have an essay in, in Judaism for the World called Judaism is a Path of Love, dedicated to my late wife. And it's all about it's all about that message of that message of love. And we are here because we love this tradition. And we are here because we find this tradition has has led us to moments of great inner beauty and truth. And we want to share that with other people. And we want to pass it on to future generations. They will reshape it in their own way as we have reshaped it in our way. Um, listen, if I were to give the Yiddishkeit that my grandfather gave to me, to my granddaughter, it would be a terrible distortion. Mm -hmm. My grandfather grew up in a shtetl where there was nothing but a horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, uh, and there were two kinds of people, Yidin and Goyim. And Goyim hated Yidin and Yidin feared Goyim. And that's the way it was. And, mm -hmm. And my grandchildren go to a public school where, where there are about 15 or 17 different languages heard in the schoolyard when the parents come to pick their kids up in a very, in a very, in a very multicultural kind of place. It's a, it's a, thank God they don't experience anti-Semitism. It's a very different world. Mm. And so it's got to be a very different Judaism for them. I know that. And at the same time, I still want it to be, to be rich and knowledgeable in the sources and in the, and in the praxis and so on. And how you do both of those at the same time is a Great. is a big yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> you know, for me, it's more than the message. For me, it's the passion, it's the heart uh -huh. that, that really shines through all of your work and yeah. all of your words. Because uh, because words, <clears throat> words in the end of the day are, are meaningless at a certain point. Yeah. But no, it's it, is, it, is, it is about a passion. It's yeah. about a passion for the sources yeah. and a passion for the, for the light that I have been privileged to see yeah. through them. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, wa I'm wondering now, and in also thinking about who's who's listening and watching up until this point and knowing my audience, many of them who who weren't born Jewish or into Jewish families or don't identify as Jewish. Um, although I know in your own work that definition is also expanded in beautiful and challenging ways. For for someone who's not Jewish, conventionally speaking, um, who who see who who's been following your work and, and is this following bro this broader Israel that I talked about this Israel, all those who wrestled with God, the one who struggled with God, correct? Yeah, which I think is a beautiful and and a definition which also introduces a lot of struggle as 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 it is. It's like a performative definition in some sense. 
um, f- I, I get this question a lot from from people who are not Jewish that are that are turned on and fascinated by um, Hasidic thought, whether that's through Buber or through Zeitlin or through Heschel or through through your work, and they want to know what's what's their place in all this. What is what what does their spiritual life look for, look like from the perspective of of someone like yourself? I have to go back to Zeitlin. Zeitlin said. Judaism succeeded best in the Second Temple period, mm. when the courtyards of the Temple were filled with non-Jews, with Yirei Hashem, with people whom they called God-fearers, who had not become Jews, not converted, but were also there for the message. And we somehow lost that. Somehow Christianity picked that up, mm. and we lost it when we made, we made the decision to stay with the Jewish people, and Paul made the decision to go beyond the bounds of the Jewish people. Mm. Um, but there are there are people out there for who, who want who want that message. Who want that message through us, not through the Christian or the or the Muslim uh, recreation of it, and um, and I think we have to be able to do that, um, and say, yes, pick up certain certain aspects of praxis that might be useful to you. Think of we. I think we should create some kind of ger toshav mm. uh, um, formal designation where we say this person is a is a fellow traveler with mm. the Jewish people mm. through life. Mm. Um, and is welcome in the Jewish community as such, mm. uh, even though he she has not become a Jew in the full sense and taken on taken on halachic obligation and so on. However, however we mean that, but there are certain there are certain things like I would say I would say um, noticing uh, noticing that change of light twice a day and understanding that those are sacred moments. Um, uh, some kind of Sun Shabbat. I think Shabbat is one of the great gifts. We have to give to the world finding finding a Shabbat that works for you. Yeah. You are not restricted by the halachic by the halachic uh, games that we have to play with it. And so take it and use it in a, in a creative way mm. and create create a Shabbat for yourselves. Mm. Because you're involved in Jewish learning, you might want to read the Torah with us through the cycle of the year, mm. um, and, and 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 go on that journey and maybe add other things to it from mm. from whatever other traditions you're involved with. Mm. But I would say I would say one one can create a kind of praxis for a sort of um, uh, um, Judaism light, mm. but not light on the spiritual content, light on the praxis side for people who want to be fellow travelers of Jews. And I think we should create such a path, or such paths. Fascinating. That's a fascinating um, prospect. I'm not the first one to say it, but nobody has really formally done it yet. Right. Right. It's interesting because there have been attempts to articulate something like this. I know that the Lubavitch Rebbe was was very forward on promoting Sheva Mitzvah Spenerich the Seven Noahide Laws, but it doesn't. It sounds quite different what you're what you're putting forth yes. here. that wasn't about creating community in any way. Right, it was just about. Creating. If I had, if I had another few decades to be creative, I would want to. I, I talked for, with some of my students and, and was unhappy they didn't follow up on it. I would like to create adult summer learning programs, summer camps. Mm. We've learned how important summer camps are for educating young Jews. I would mm. say for people who are interested in Judaism, thinking about Judaism, maybe converting, maybe not converting, mm. a six-week intensive summer institute mm. where you live the life of Judaism and study study some Torah every day and become familiar with and then you make your own decision. Yes, I want to become Jewish. No, I don't want to become Jewish, but I want to remain. I want to retain this or retain that and pick up this practice. I think I think we could be we could be a little more missionary, so to speak, mm. in that in that sense in the outer world. A bit I don't more think, evangelical. I don't think we have to I don't think we have to be afraid of that. Right. Not, of course, not competing and not right. putting other religions right. down right. and nothing like that. But still opening the door to to Jewish wisdom. Right. To people who are not fully uh, fully ready to become Jews. Yeah. I think that would be a good thing That's to fascinating. do. That's fascinating. You know, there's a there's a typical blessing within the Hasidic community of Yarech Yamimam Lachtecha that we bless people that they should have many more years uh, above running their, your kingdom, running their kingdom, that dominion. <laughs> and and I wish you that. I really wish you that. Thank and I you. think that I think that what's incredible when I when I reflect on on your life is not just you're not just a man of ideas, which you certainly are in a very rich way, and you've contributed even in a very technical academic sense to whether it's the understanding of the early role that the sphere of Keter played or the role of the Shekhinah, besides for, besides for ideas and your, your public-facing ideas, your, your popular books, you're also a man of action and you've created community again and again. Almost wherever you go, it seems like you create community. 
And, uh, and I think if God does bless you with a few more years, well, we may see something like that. And uh, I think we'd all be richer for it. Amen. I'm on your side. <laughs>